Every morning, as the sun's first rays bathed my room, the weight of reality bore down on me. There I was, a single mother in my late twenties, tending to my five-year-old, Amy. I had such high hopes for her, and for myself. Our shared dreams, my ambitions for us to be more than our circumstances, always drove me. Our house was small and worn out, much like the elderly woman who occupied the armchair in the living room, my mother. There was a time I loved her deeply, but that emotion had been replaced by resentment and frustration. Blinded by my own pain and anger, I couldn't see past her immobility. I told you, Mom, I'd often shout, tears streaming down. If it weren't for you, he would have stayed. Her frail voice would then tremble. Sweetheart, you can't blame me for his choices. But I did. My boyfriend, Amy's father, had been unable to cope with my mother's paralysis. Or perhaps he was searching for an excuse. Either way, I always believed she was the reason he abandoned us. He never liked you, I spat one evening. All your medications, your helplessness, it's overwhelming. She looked at me, her watery eyes mirroring years of sacrifice. I'm still your mother, she whispered. One day, my best friend Lana visited. Over coffee, her words were like sharp knives. You need to get out of here, she urged, her eyes darting to my mother. For Amy's sake. But I was obstinate. He might come back. He might change, I responded, clinging to a hope that was as thin as a thread. Clara, she sighed, using my name to stress her point. You're living in a fantasy. He's gone. It's been months. But then, reality slapped harder. He did leave. One morning I found a short note explaining nothing. It was over, and my heart sank with a pain I thought I'd never feel. In the days that followed, my relationship with my mother deteriorated further. I couldn't stand the sight of her, reminding me of my failures. The idea of a fresh start started occupying my mind, a place without reminders of my past mistakes, somewhere Amy could thrive. One evening, as Amy played with her toys and my mother watched her favorite TV show, I broke the news. I'm thinking of moving out, Mom, away from all this. Amy and I need a new start. She turned off the TV, her face pallid. You can't mean that, Clara. Why not? You want me to stick around living in this misery? I want a better life for Amy. She choked back tears. I need you, sweetheart. I may be paralyzed, but my heart isn't. It still beats for you and Amy. My resolve hardened. We deserve better, Mom. Better than this life. Better than watching you wither away in that chair. She looked at Amy, who was staring at us, sensing the tension. I've given everything for you, Clara, and I'd give it all again if it meant having you and Amy by my side. I sighed, frustrated, rubbing my temples. The decision was made, but the weight of it bore down on me, making every day harder than the last. The tension in the room had been thick enough to slice through ever since I announced my decision. Mom's eyes perpetually held a glimmer of suppressed tears, and that made me feel a fusion of guilt and defiance. I was hell-bent on leaving, and nothing was going to change that, not even the pained look that took permanent residence on my mother's face. One evening, Mom wheeled herself into my room, a pained expression plastered across her face. She had something to say, something she hoped would change my mind. Clara, her voice quivered. You don't have to leave because of me. Because of the burden you think I am. I turned away, clenching my jaw, restraining the emotions that threatened to pour out. She continued, I have a substantial pension, more than enough to look after both of us and then some. I could hire a nurse. I wouldn't be a burden on you. Please, reconsider. I could hear the desperation in her voice, but my own bitterness drowned it out. It's not just about the money, Mom. It's about having a life. Amy needs a future, and she won't have one if we stay here, tethered to the past. Amy loves me, and I love her. I've devoted my life to you, Clara. All I need is to see you two for a few minutes each day. Is that too much to ask after everything? My heart twisted with every plea, but I forced myself to remain stone-faced. 
What you call devotion, I call obligation, Mom. You did what any mother would. Now I am doing what I think is best for my daughter. A tiny voice emerged from the doorway. Mommy, are you sending Grandma away? Amy's innocent eyes bore into mine, and for a moment, I was stung by a pang of guilt. I knelt down to her level, forcing a smile. No, sweetheart. Grandma is staying here. We are moving to a new place, remember? Just you and me. But I want Grandma, too. Her lip trembled, eyes moistening. You love me, don't you? Mom's voice trembled from behind. I've been there for every school play, every bedtime story when Clara had to work late. This is how you repay me? I rose, my gaze fixed on Mom. This isn't about repayment. It's about moving forward. You're stuck, Mom. But I won't let Amy and I be stuck, too. Mom lifted a hand to wipe away the tear that had escaped down her cheek. Her voice softened, barely audible. If you're set on this, at least stay close, so I can visit Amy, so I don't lose you both entirely. But my mind was set, and my voice came out colder than I intended. We're moving to Portland, Mom. It's not close. I don't want you dropping by, bringing back the past every time we start to forget. We need a clean break. She shook her head, more in disbelief than resistance. Why, Clara? Why would you completely shut me out like this? The answer was on the tip of my tongue, but I didn't utter it. The truth was too bitter, too filled with years of pent-up anger and frustration. That night, Amy cried herself to sleep, her sobs a haunting lullaby of the pain I was causing. And as I listened to Mom's quiet crying through the wall, a part of me wondered if the freedom I so desperately sought would be worth the heartbreak I was leaving in my wake. But my decision was made. My course was set. Amy and I were leaving, escaping towards a new life, while the tendrils of the old tried desperately to cling on. The future was uncertain, and the past was painful. My only hope was that in escaping the pain, Amy and I could find the happiness that always seemed just out of reach. My life took on new contours in Portland. With Amy by my side, I was determined to carve out a bright, bountiful future, unfettered by the haunting shadows of the past. I had managed to convince myself that abandoning Mom had been an act of self-preservation rather than heartless neglect. But one never truly forgets, do they? A somber call came on a sun-dappled afternoon. The voice at the other end informed me that Mom had passed away, lost in a profound grief that engulfed her after Amy and I left. I remember the moment vividly, the tightening in my chest, and the barely perceptible shake in my hands. Despite learning about her demise in ample time to attend her funeral, I didn't. I told myself it was due to work, obligations, life. But deep down, a well of regret and guilt churned incessantly. Then came Ethan into my life, a charming, vivacious man who seemed to eclipse the guilt lurking in the corners of my conscience with his vibrant, alluring presence. I was enamored, and before long, my life became intertwined with his. But Ethan was more parasitic than partner, siphoning off my resources while offering nothing but empty promises and transient caresses in return. Years rolled forward like a relentless tide, and Amy blossomed into a beautiful, albeit solemn, young woman. Her eyes, once filled with boundless joy and curiosity, now often flickered with a silent sadness a residue of the unseen scars left by Ethan's vile, predatory advances. One haunting evening, Amy came to me, her voice trembling, her eyes glassy with unshed tears. Mom, Ethan, he's not good. He's done things, said things. But I turned a blind eye, deaf to her desperate pleas, blinded by my misplaced loyalty to a man who had offered me a semblance of happiness amid the guilt that plagued me. Amy, stop! I snapped. A fierce protectiveness for Ethan, or perhaps for my own fragile happiness, bubbling to the surface. I won't hear a word against him. If you say anything like this again, you'll find yourself on the streets. Amy recoiled, eyes wide, before sinking into a melancholy acceptance, silently retreating into a cocoon of sorrow and solitude. She lived like that for years, under our roof yet miles away 
until one day she just left. I remember looking at the note, the letters a stark black against the white paper, explaining that she needed to find her own way, far away from Ethan and the mother who wouldn't believe her. More years rolled by, and the relationship with Ethan turned bitter, devoid of the initial charm and apparent affection that had once defined it. The house echoed with Amy's absence, every silent room a deafening reminder of the daughter I had failed. One day, a letter adorned with Amy's familiar, elegant handwriting arrived. My hands trembled as I opened it, revealing pictures of Amy with a kind-looking man, children playing at their feet, and a home bathed in warm, glowing light, a stark contrast to the dark, desolate walls of my own dwelling. And so, my daughter had built her life, a life free from the agonizing shadows that had plagued her existence under my roof. The letter was devoid of resentment, speaking instead of a quiet happiness, a peaceful life carved out in the aftermath of turbulent years. But there were no contact details, no return address, just a final, silent message of, I am okay, but I am gone. As I gazed at Amy's smiling face in the pictures, a cascade of realization washed over me. Her resilience, the life she had managed to carve out for herself, it was all a mirror reflecting back the harrowing truth of my own failures and betrayals. Gently touching the image of her content face, my tears fell freely, a mix of relief for her newfound happiness and a profound, aching loss for the daughter I realized I never truly knew, nor deserved. Ah, the way life circles back at you, it's quite remarkable. I, once a symbol of relentless ambition and stoic determination, now found myself ensnared in a paradox, a cruel reflection of the past I'd sought to escape. My relationship with Ethan had transcended into a comforting stability, or so I had fooled myself into believing. One sunny afternoon, my heart brimming with affection and a naive optimism, I looked into his eyes, a softness in my gaze. Ethan, I think it's time. Time to make our years together mean something more, something official. I proposed, my voice barely above a whisper. He looked at me, that familiar charm flickering in his eyes, yet something sinister lurked beneath the surface. Darling, he began, his voice caressing every syllable. You have my word. I will make you my wife. But oh, promises can be so flimsily ephemeral, can't they? I discovered Ethan's plan mere days before it was due to unfold, a scheme bathed in deceit and cruel intention. He had fallen for another, a wealthy woman who had become smitten by his eloquent words and seductive demeanor. Confronting him was a tempest of emotions, anger and betrayal intertwining into a painful tapestry. My voice, once soft, now quivered with a potent mix of rage and sorrow. How could you, Ethan? With an unsettling calmness, he responded. You've aged, dear. Your youthful allure has withered away, and quite frankly, you're no longer suitable for me. His words pierced through me, a cruel reminder of the unwavering passage of time and the shifting of affection. Not long after, a stroke stole my mobility, confining me to a wheelchair, and depression darkened my days. Savings drained away, siphoned into a seemingly endless pit of medical expenses and futile attempts to clutch at the strands of a fast-depleting life. I, once a beacon of independence, now found myself in the throes of desperation, reaching out to the one person I thought I might be able to depend on, Amy. I can still feel the raw anxiety that bubbled within me as I dialed her number, the haunting memory of my own mother's desperate pleas echoing in the dark recesses of my mind. Amy, it's me, Mom, I began, my voice a mere whisper, brimming with regret and a quiet desperation. I find myself in need of your help. Her voice was cold, a stark contrast to the warm, loving daughter I remembered. Why should I, mother? You turned away from your own, pushed me away when I needed you the most. Amy, I am so, so sorry. The words tumbled out, a cascade of regret and a too late realization. I just hope you might find it within yourself to break this cycle, to be better than the mother who failed you. Amy pondered. 
You're asking a lot, Mom. I haven't forgotten what you did to Grandma, nor the way you sided with Ethan over me. I pleaded, my voice drenched in a despairing acknowledgement of my past wrongs. I have regrets, Amy, and I'm living them. I don't wish this pain on you or anyone else. My only ask, my final request. When my time comes, please attend my funeral. Don't replicate my heartless absence. The line went silent for what seemed like an eternity before Amy spoke, her voice a soft murmur. I'll think about it, Mom. We are often prisoners of our past, and my actions had built a fortress of pain and betrayal that kept Amy at bay. Still, as I lived my days in the solitude of regret, I harbored a glimmer of hope that the seeds of remorse I had sown might one day blossom into a future of reconciliation for Amy and her own children. A future where the cycle is broken and compassion triumphs over pain. The story has come to its conclusion, but a question lingers. If you were in Amy's shoes, would you have found it in your heart to forgive and break the cycle? Or would you have held on to the resentment? Please share your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this animated story, don't forget to hit that like button and consider subscribing to OSA, Our Stories Animated, for more thought-provoking tales. Your interaction means the world to us.